cry. I want, I want to have meaning in life. Turn, turn to Psalm 35. Psalm 35. The intensity of the emotions are tremendous. If we found the longing of connection in the Psalms of Lament, and we find the longing or the drive for meaning in the Psalms of Wisdom, then the drive or longing for righteousness we find in what's called the imprecatory Psalms, the Psalms that want to bring judgment. The one Psalm that was read, Psalm 59, is one. This is another one, Psalm 35. And here I want you to note the drive for righteousness, the things work right. Psalm 35. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of the buckler and the shield and rise up for my help. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be ashamed and dishonored who seek my life. Let those be turned back and humiliated who devise evil against me. Let them be like shaft before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them on. Let their way be dark and slippery, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hide their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my soul. Let destruction come upon him unawares. And let the net which he has uh, catch, to, that he catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. And my soul shall rejoice in the Lord. It shall, be, it shall exult in his salvation. All my bones will say, Lord, who is like thee, who delivers the afflicted from him who is too strong for him, and the afflicted and the needy from him who robs him? Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask for me. Uh, uh, they ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good, to the bereavement of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothes were uh, was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayers kept returning to my bosom. I went about as though it were my friend or brother. I bowed down, mourning as one who sorrows for a mother. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. The smiters, who I did not know, gathered together against me. They slander me without ceasing. Like godless jesters at the feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long would thou look on? Rescue my soul from their ravages, my only life from the lions. I will give. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among the mighty throng. Do not let those who are wrongful, uh, do wrongfully uh, my enemies rejoice over me. Neither let those who hate me without a cause wink maliciously. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful words against those who are quite uh, quiet in the land. And they open their mouth wide against me. They say, ha, 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 our eyes have seen it. Thou hast seen it, O Lord. Do not keep silent. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to my right and, do my, and, and to my cause, O God, my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness and do not let them rejoice over me. Do not let them say in their heart, ha, ha, our desire. Do not let them say, we have swallowed him up. Let those be ashamed and humiliated altogether with, who rejoice at my distress. Let those be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves over me. Let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication. Let them say continually, the Lord be magnified, who delights in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall declare thy righteousness. Thy praise all day long. The feelings are very intense. For connection, for meaning, for righteousness. These are the Psalms. 
But there's a problem. The problem is that most of us do not feel that intensely. We're afraid of emotions. But emotions can be used to investigate what is going on within our hearts and what are we doing with God. The circumstance is really irrelevant. It's what's going on within us that we, as we investigate, we will find out what we're actually doing with God. How are we relating to him? Emotions, they are like the windows or a door that we are to move into, go into the house and find out. But they're messy, as I mentioned last week. Um, emotions, someone wrote, uh, seem to be one of the least reliable yet most influential forces that guide our lives. Isn't that something? That's the way it is. Emotions seem to be so hodgepodge. That's why you hear the statement, don't go by your emotions. Because it can be so confusing. And yet, emotions influence and dr they're one of the most powerful drives that we have within us to make us do and say things that we don't want to do or say. And that's many times we're not aware of what's really going on inside. We don't want to run from our emotions. Emotions link our inner world and our external worlds. Our emotions link what's going on inside with what's going on on the outside. Um, to be aware of what we're feeling can open questions that we normally don't want to ask. That's another reason why we don't enter our feelings. Because they will raise tremendous questions that we do not want to ask. That's why for many of us it's easier not to feel. We don't want to enter the confusion and we don't want to expose some questions that we really need to ask. So we'd rather deaden ourselves or feel other feelings that are more acceptable or change the subject, or, or get busy. But a failure to feel, listen to this carefully, the failure to feel leaves us barren and distant from God and others. It leaves us barren and distant from God and others. That's why sometimes when we pray, we don't feel close to God. Maybe we're not looking at things that we need to be looking at. You see? Our guide for going into our emotions are going to be the Psalms and uh, this sermon is going to be so limited. I strongly urge you to, to study, to go back into the Psalms and, 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 and think through what's going to be said. Uh, and at the very least, if I can get you at least to value emotions. Never mind if you disagree with a lot of what I say, that's okay, but at least think and maybe raise your value for emotions and enter them there. The book of Psalms, John Calvin wrote this about the Psalms, of the, the whole book of Psalms. I have been one to call this book, not inappropriately, an anatomy of all parts of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. The psalmists draw each of us to examine uh, draw each one of us to, to the examination of himself in particular, in order that none of the many infirmities to which we are subject and of the many vices with which we abound may remain concealed. In other words, the Psalms reveal the infirmities and sins that are there. 
I said last week, the Psalms are like raw soul. They expose what we normally don't want to see. I'm going to read from this book that I recommended last week, The Cry of the Soul, How Our Emotions Reveal Our Deepest Questions About God. Isn't that great? Normally we think of emotions as, oh, let me see, let me read a book on how to handle emotions. No, this is not a book about how to handle emotions. This is about how we can use emotions to reveal our relationship with God and what we're doing with God and what we're doing with other people. You see? Um, Let me read just a little bit here. It's by Dr. Dan Allender and Tremper Longman, by the way. Uh, Nev Press, The Cry of the Soul. I read, perhaps no section of scripture more poignantly exposes the inner world of our heart and more vividly reveals our emotional life of God than the Psalms. The Psalms were composed in poetic form. Poetry reaches to the realm beyond the world of sight and sound to reveal what our senses long to see and hear. It is the language not so much of the sublime, but of the truly real. A reality that cannot be grasped through scientific or a theoretical precision. Theological pre- uh, prepositions are necessary for understanding truth, but truth is ultimately relational. And relationship is the domain of poetry. Poetry is God's invitation to glimpse the unseen, his very character. We focus primarily on what we have been called the Psalms of Disorientation or Lament Psalms. This type of psalm captures the struggle of the heart as uh, as the poet attempts, and here's the key, as the poet attempts to grasp the goodness of God in the light of the heartache of life. That's the struggle of the psalmist. To grapple with the fact that God is good. But children are born, are born stillborn. Cancer eats away at human beings. Tornadoes and hurricanes kill. Broken homes. How do we wrestle with that, the fact that God is good? And yet all these tragedies happen, you see? Abortion, illegitimate children, abusive homes. The psalmist wrestles with that, you see? Oh, great, great value in seeing that trying to get a hold of the goodness of God while living in a fallen world. But we must be willing to wrestle with God. Did you hear David Jab's statement? I was like Jacob, he said. I had to wrestle with God. I spent time alone, he said. Did you hear that? He had to wrestle with God. But when we do wrestle with God and we deal with our emotions, they will expose the tragedy of our world and the darkness of our hearts. No wonder we don't want to feel. It exposes. When we enter our our feelings, it exposes the illusion that life is good and predictable and safe. Sometimes we think that way. We can handle life. Life is predictable. If I do this and this and this, and this ought to be the outcome. Doesn't work that way. You see. We need to feel very, very deeply. We need to allow ourselves to feel very, very deeply. When we do, it will expose our struggle, our own struggle with God and others. So here's my message. We must not be afraid to enter our mysterious emotional life, but rather 
approach God with all our being. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? Your pinky? No, thou shalt love the Lord God with everything about you. Everything about you. I mean, you see? We must not be afraid to enter our mysterious emotional life, but rather approach God with all of our being. I want to look at Psalm 25 in a little bit more detail, real quickly. Um, and I want you to see the, uh, how David struggled with God in a little bit more detail. What to expect in this psalm or, uh, as we approach God, and then some applications. First of all, how to approach God. Some of you remember that song? Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Remember that one? Unto thee, O Lord. This is, this is where it comes from. Psalm 25. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. <laughs> there is an intensity here, an earnestness. He is fervently coming to God. There isn't this, well, I guess it's time for my quiet time. Well, I guess it's time for prayer. Oh, unto thee, O oh Lord, I, my soul I'm bringing to you. I'm dying here desperately inside. How many times do we approach God that way? point made. We don't usually interact with God with such intensity. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh my God, in thee I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. It's not only intensity here. I mean, he's coming with his whole heart, comprehensively, wholeheartedly, turning to God with all that he is. And he's turning to God. He's putting all his eggs in one basket. God, if it is not you, then I have nothing. Don't let me be ashamed. I'm putting my all in all in you, God. Don't let me be ashamed because you're it. That's it. Is something? Such great, great intensity. And yet there's confidence there. Verse 3. Indeed, none of those who wait for thee shall be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without a cause will be ashamed. The context here is David is about to get killed. He is surrounded by his enemies. He's being persecuted. Lord, you're going to do what's right. But let me tell you, I'm scared to death. And I'm coming to you with all that I am, God. Don't let me down. Have a relationship with anyone like that? That you can go to him and say, you know, you just can tell him, oh, this is where I am with all that I am. This is how David is coming to God. You see? He's wanting righteousness. He's wanting to do things to work the way they're supposed to. But he's coming with all intensity. And when we begin to look at the, uh, the fallenness of our world, the realities, the harsh realities of our world, and we are willing to enter into that, you know what? There's going to be a thousand amps of electricity coming out. It's going to be pretty intense. He's being threatened. He's about to get killed. Now, when you or I and I are being threatened, how do we respond? When we're about to lose something that we love dearly, or something that we have been working for for many years, how do we respond? How do we respond when we're being persecuted? I know how I respond. Where's my gun? Honey, where's my gun? Oh, it may not be a literal gun but the gun of my words. Right? Or, if it's not where the gun, or, uh, where's my motorcycle so I can get out of here? How can I fly away from here? How can I escape? 
Move away from the situation because I'm, I, I don't want to deal with this. See? Either fight or flight. David didn't do that. David did not do that. What did he do? Verse 4. He stayed teachable. He stayed teachable. Verse 4. Make me know thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy path. What a difference, right? Normally we want to get the shotgun out or the fastest vehicle out. David says, no, I'm going to stay in the middle of this. In the middle of this mess, in the middle of this threatening situation, teach me, O God. Teach me. He comes to God trusting in the goodness of God. David is, is, is submissive. Verse 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. For thee I wait all day long, trusting in the goodness of God. In the midst of confusing times, David was king. He had been anointed king. And yet he was about to get killed. How many of you, how many of us trust in the goodness of God? How many of us really are moved by the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ? To the point that when things are threatening, we are not moved to fight or flight. But we stay in there knowing that God is good. And that we can learn from this. We can learn about our relationship with him and our relationship with others. We don't have to do all these things. See, but many times because we really don't appreciate the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Then we react. Some of us don't even realize how bad we are. The great value of the cross. Jeremiah says, my people don't even know how to blush. Can you imagine? Jeremiah 6. It's a, a, a very telling passage. And as I read it, I think of our times and it's so similar. When I look at our TV, even the religious station and maybe especially the religious station. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13 through 15. For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. And they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abominations they have done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. And if that's our situation, the cross, oh, man, pretty good. But we're not broken down in all and say, I don't deserve anything other than to serve the Lord. And if he wants me to suffer 20, 100 years, that's okay. Because he has saved me by the blood of the Christ. Let me learn, O oh God. Let me enter the confusion. What am I feeling? What's going on here? Let me study. Let me learn. Teach me, O oh God. Show me your ways. What are you doing? What does he learn? What does he learn? He learns about the character of God. He learns about the character of God. Oh, my. 25, uh, Psalm 25 again. Remember, he's approached God on the basis of his goodness. If we follow verse 6 and 7, Remember, O Lord, thy compassion and thy loving kindness, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to thy loving kindness, remember thou me. For thy goodness sake, O Lord. You see? But after coming to the Lord in that way, what does he learn? He learns about the very character of God. Imagine, imagine you in the middle of suffering, in the middle of persecution, turning to God and receiving a new revelation of the character of God. And that's what he gets here. Look at verse 8. Good and upright. 
is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice. And he teaches the humble his way. Good and upright. Justice is good. Our greatest need of our time is to have a fresh revelation, a, a, a fresh uh, uh, learning experience of who God is. And here it is in the Psalms. He gets a new revelation of who God is, good and upright. All the paths of the Lord are loving, kindness, and truth. Hey, can you imagine? Everything, realizing that even this persecution, even this suffering, God is doing everything perfectly. Isn't that great? Usually we you know, God, what are you doing? Oh, we don't do that physically, but you and I know. We stay angry with God. <laughs> Here David says, all your ways, Lord, all your ways. You know exactly what you're doing. And in getting that revelation, you know what else he gets? He gets a revelation of himself. To all those who keep your covenant, he says. All those who keep the covenant. I'm not keeping the covenant. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of persecution, that is the last thing you and I think about. That's the last thing you and I realize, that we are sinning. But David comes to this point. He's about to get killed. He turns to God and, and teach me, oh God. I'm not going to run away. I need to learn of you. And he learns of the character of God. And in the midst of learning of the character of God, he also learns of himself and he says, oh my goodness. I am undone. Look at verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity because it is great. <laughs> Whoa, we don't like that revelation. Remember? Entering into a who we are, our emotional state will show us what we're really doing with God. He'll show us what we're doing with other people. Pardon my iniquity, O oh God, because it is great. And remember, he's about to get killed. Now, what happens after that? He gains incredible wisdom. He gains a wisdom he has not had before. He gains insight. Verse 12. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. In other words, the highest priority is not so much my well-being, but fearing the Lord, respecting the Lord, knowing that we are accountable to him. Most fundamental in life. And it's great wisdom. It's great wisdom. He who fears the Lord, the Lord will be instructed. More wisdom. Verse 13. His soul will abide in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. Ultimately, God will be working for your good. That's great wisdom. Instead of manipulating and, 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 and doing all kinds of things to gain prosperity. <laughs> no. That's great wisdom to trust in the Lord. More wisdom. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he will make them know his covenant. You are going to understand more and more of the ways of God. Is that something? It's one thing to know about how the IRS works. It's another thing to know about how God works. Not that we're going to know everything, but we're going, it's like, uh, uh, the, the way of the righteous is brighter and brighter and brighter until the noonday light. You see? And more wisdom. Verse 15. My eyes are continually towards the Lord, for, for he will put my, my feet out of the net. In other words, as I turn to God in the midst of these trying times, and I enter to understand what's going on inside of me, the Lord is going to keep me away 
from being caught in I quit this behavior, but by the time I know it, I've done it. And we're caught in a net. And David says, as I concentrate and I enter what's going on with me, and I stay teachable rather than fighting or, or, or flying away. I stay teachable. The Lord shows me how I will stay free from being caught in some sin or, or some entrapment that someone has for me. That great, oh, that's great wisdom. Mm. But now, but now, one of the greatest benefits is gaining a relationship with God. As troubles come in life, and our emotions are all over the place, and we don't fight, we don't fly away, we don't escape, we stay in the middle of it, asking God to help us. The deepest relationship with God will grow. Let me ask you a question. What's one of the greatest characteristics in a good, good relationship? One of the greatest characteristics in a, in a very healthy, good, loving relationship is this. That the one person can share absolutely everything with the other, knowing that the other will not reject, but embrace. Isn't that the truth? Those of us that are married know what I'm talking about. When we're able just to say, here I am, and your spouse just embraces, doesn't fight, doesn't defend, they just embrace. That's a good relationship. And now, this is what David has gained with God. As he has stayed in the middle, now he tells God anything and everything. Look at verse 16 and following. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my afflictions and my troubles and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies for they are many. And they hate me with a violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed for I take refuge in thee. Some of us don't know much of that type of a relationship where you can just pour out knowing that the goodness of God will stand firm. The goodness of God, the loving kindness of God is from of old. We don't know God that way. We don't know anybody that way. And so we're very lonely people trying to make life work without God. It's awful. It's awful. And so I pray, oh my, look at the clock. Well, quickly then. A reminder. Our emotions are only one of several capacities we have been given to help us grow in maturity and the, lo and the knowledge of God. Though I'm not, because we have preached on emotions this Sunday, doesn't mean that this is the key or this is you know, the only way to maturity. No, no, that's not it. Okay? It's one of a number of capacities. Just a quick reminder. Uh, you know, the world is dying for authenticity. The world is dying to know someone that is real. Especially our young people. Our young people are sick and tired of facades. They're sick and tired of just people putting on a show, playing church, cut the garbage. Now, if we want to be authentic, we're going to have to be willing and enter into our emotional life. Otherwise, we're going to work at superficiality and keeping things under control. Not too much, not too little, just... Mm. 
the world will see we're not authentic. Is it going to be messy? It's going to be messy. One of the things, sometimes things are going to get out of control, they're going to get out of control. Well, welcome to the human race. We find, we realize, we have no control. But we may want to stay in the illusion that we have control. The world is dying for authenticity. We want to communicate the truth of the gospel with power. Then we want to be authentic. You want to be authentic? Enter into the emotional life. Value your emotions. Hey, W. Tozer said, how long must we in America go on listening to men who can only tell us what they have read and heard about? Never what they themselves have felt and heard and seen. <laughs> it's a great quote. Love it. Um, if accomplishments, if accomplishing projects and efficiency have been the life motivators for you, then this hasn't been a very good sermon for you. Ecclesiastes 7, 1 through 4 says, enter into the house of mourning. The mind of the, of the wise is in the house of mourning. The mind of the fools is in the house of feasting. Read Ecclesiastes 7, 1 and following. Listen, if you're already emotional, uh, if you have <laughs> water balloons as tear ducts, or you have a, 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 a shotgun, you know, you know, you're already pretty emotional. All right. It's not a matter of just suppressing and denying and, and controlling your emotions. No, it's a matter of, of entering and learning through those emotions. You're still responsible to act morally. If you act in an unkind way, in, in, in a way that's this destructive, that's not right. Cut it out. But that doesn't mean that you throw your emotions away either. Okay? Study them. Enter. Be aware of what's going on. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for all your goodness, God, and thank you that you can handle all that's inside of us even when we cannot. We pray, our Lord, that your spirit would guide and direct and that uh, the things that are extreme and um, not quite true, Lord, that, that you would weed out, that you would clarify. And Father, we pray that you would give courage. Give us courage, Father, to trust you to not be afraid to enter in who we, where we really are. Father, if there's someone here who does not know Jesus Christ, we pray, our God, that this morning would be the greatest morning for them. That they would come to realize that they are a sinner, accountable to God Almighty. But that they realize that Jesus Christ has paid the price for them and that they would trust in the salvation that Jesus offers because he paid the price. If you're here and you've never trusted, will you? Will you trust Christ? Oh, we beg you, trust in Jesus Christ. Never mind your friends. Never mind who may be sitting around you. Trust in Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of you coming forward, of doing all kinds of mental gymnastics. Realize that you're a sinner and that Jesus died for you. He paid the price. Won't you trust him? Oh, trust him. Thank you again, Father. And you know, you know we come not in our name, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.